The Lord my God, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. May the Lord God awaken Memphis to listen as disciples. So I have my word of greeting to those you've already heard in Jesus' name. You can go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel 23. And um, I, I like what Henry just did. I don't know if he did it intentionally or, or not, but he was, he was casting a nearly impossible vision where he was, he was kind of saying, you know, you, you really should go to Uganda. That's, that's, it's obvious that God wants you to go to Uganda. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, is that realistic? But then at the end, remember, he said, so if you don't do that, come to Shelby Farms. <laughs> so he immediately told us something, well, why wouldn't we do that? You know, we, we may have a million excuses why we're not going to go to Uganda, but we don't have any excuse not to do that. And you know, most of us are very, 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 very conservative. And because we're very, very conservative, by the way, Roberto, who was introduced, he's from Argentina, so we need to be careful what we say. And John is from India, so we need to be careful what we say. But because we're conservative, we get all riled up about the border crisis. And we're glad that our ancestors were not blocked at the border, but this is, this is now, and we get all riled up. But you know, once they're here, it's our responsibility to, to make Christians out of them if the Holy Spirit would allow us to do that. Once they're here, there's no controversy. We love our neighbor. Whatever you think about politically about the um, immigration policies, uh, once they're here, and boy, let me tell you something, they're at Shelby Farms. It's unbelievable what happens at Shelby Farms on the weekend, probably during the week too. I've never been during the week. So um, here's what I want to do. Um, I want to talk about something else that you can do that's really easy and that's, that's really necessary. And uh, Sunday at first event, I preached on maybe the fam most famous story in the world. It's the story of David and Goliath. And it's a story that we find in 1 Samuel 17. And I talked about eight things that David did. One of the things I talked about, and I'll just mention a couple of things, is he, uh, he overcame the opposition of friends. Now, it's, it's one thing to be opposed by the devil. It's another thing to be opposed by your, your brother. Eliab, his older brother, told him, get out of here. Go back to those sheep. Le leave the battle line. And I'm sure it's, it still stung for Eliab, that memory of Samuel coming among the sons of Jesse. And Eliab had every right to think that he would be anointed because he was the oldest. And um, David got the same welcome from Eliab that Joseph got from his brothers when he went out to check on their welfare. And David was doing the same thing. He was checking on the welfare of his brothers. And by the way, before that, he was not trying to become the most famous person in Israel when he got up that morning. He was trying to obey the lowly and obscure instructions of his father. That's where we start. We start in the lowest place, to be obedient in the lowest, obscure places. What did you do in the war, David? Well, I, I carried the cheese. That's what he was trying to do. He was just trying to carry the cheese. So after he overcame the objection of his jealous brother and his cowardly leader, who masked cowardice with strategy and said, you can't do this. You're just a kid. Then he had to choose his weapons. And he was offered the weapons of the king. And he said, I can't go with these. The only enemy of Israel Saul's sword ever killed probably was Saul because Saul became a great enemy of Israel in his fanatical obsession and commitment to kill not only the most valuable strategic asset of Israel, but one of the ancestors of the Messiah. If he'd killed David, he would have killed Jesus. And David said, I can't go with these. And it was a critical decision because um, 
if you're going to fight somebody with a sling, his size is not an advantage. How tall did you say he was? Well, he's really, really tall. Well, if he's really, really tall, that's really, really good. If he's that big, I can kill him on an off day. I can't miss. And the Church of Jesus Christ, I said this Sunday, I'm sorry, the two Davids were there, David Sitton and David Kaiser, they're hearing it for the second time. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ had been offered a lot of weapons. We've been offered theatrical weapons. If you put on the best show in town, you might have the biggest church in town. We can't go with these. We've been offered psychological and sociological weapons. We've been, we've been offered therapeutic weapons. If you could just make them feel good, if you could make them feel like they can get relief from their anxieties and their pathologies in your church, maybe you can have the biggest church in town. We can't go with these. I could talk about that a long time, but I'm just saying we have to choose the weapons that we're going to do battle with if we're going to win gospel victories and if our ministries are going to look remote, remotely biblical. Now, here's the amazing things, the thing I want to talk about, and we're not going to talk about it that long. I do a lot of funerals, and uh, mortality is really encroaching on my generation. I think there was a stretch in two months late last summer early last fall where I did seven funerals in three states in, in about six weeks. And uh, most of them were really, really good friends. And um, there are usually two parts to a funeral. One is a, the first part is a eulogy. That's from two Greek words, which means good word, where you say something about the person you're saying goodbye to. And then, then there's the gospel, the good news, which you, you're telling the people why you're confident that your, your friend's current position is far better than his position the day before he died. And you're registering your confidence of why you believe you're going to see him again if you're the same like faith and hope. Well, when you, uh, when you write something in the newspaper, that's called an obituary. And when, when you write something on the grave marker, that's usually called an epitaph. And David wrote his own epitaph. Now, we're not sure um, how much the writer of 2 Samuel editorialized, how much it was a direct quote from David. We know it's all of the Holy Spirit, though. Whether, David is, is, whether the Holy Spirit has inspired David or the biblical writer of 2 Samuel. And when David um, leaves a valedictory of his own epitaph, he doesn't say, uh, I, I slew the Gittite ogre, that giant from Gath who blasphemed the God of Israel. I, uh, I did it with a sling in my hand. He doesn't mention that. He doesn't say, when we were raided at Ziklag, I brought everybody back with no loss, 1 Samuel 30. That's when they were talking about stoning him. He doesn't say, I evicted the Jebusites from Jerusalem in the eighth year of my reign, and I claim Jerusalem as, as our capital. I did that. He doesn't mention that. Um, what he talks about is uh, this. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet singer of Israel. The sweet psalmist of Israel. Not the sweet slinger of Israel. The sweet singer of Israel. Not the man who taught Israel how to war, but the man who taught Israel how to worship. Now, he did teach them how to war. But here's the significant thing. At the end of David's life, David's exploits were not publicized. It was the exploits of the men that he trained. Those were the exploits that were publicized. Verse 8, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had, Josheb Beshebeth, the Tachmanite, chief among the captains. Several unpronounceables here. He was called Adino the Esnite. 
Well, my goodness, if, if my name was Josheb the Shebeth, the Tachmanite, maybe I would like it that I was called Adino the Esnite. I have no idea why you would call somebody named that something equally unpronounceable, but because he'd killed 800 men at one time. Well, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty good day's work for a soldier. After him was Eliezer, the son of Dado, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men when, with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there to battle. And the men of Israel had, had retreated. He arose and he attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. He became one with his weapon. And by the way, it wasn't the sling in David's hand that killed Goliath. It was the servant of God in God's hand who killed the Goliath. It's the servant who is the weapon. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him to plunder. After him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. You begin to see a pattern here? Then three of the thirty chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave, cave of Adullam. The troop of Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was there in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with longing, oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well. The three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well that was by the gate, took it, and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. Looks like an insult, but it's a compliment. They risked their lives to bring him this water, and he pours it out. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm not worthy for the risk of your lives. You're overestimating me, but we can never overestimate God. God is worthy, so let's pour it out the four of us before the Lord as a sacrifice, not to me, but to the Lord. It's an amazing gesture. There are, and that's what a marriage is supposed to be, by the way, reciprocal, continual reciprocal gestures of lavish love before the Lord to one another. That's what happened. These are amazing reminiscences. There was someone called Abishai. He lifted his spear against 300 men, killed them, and won a name among those three. Benaniah was the son of Jehoiada. He had done many needs. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He had also gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. Mark Batterson in Washington, D.C. wrote a book with that title. He killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, so he went down to him with a staff, rested the spear of the Egyptian's hand, killed him with his own weapon. Now, look, let me just say this. I don't think I need to say this. I don't think it's been God's will for God's friends to kill God's enemies since Samuel killed Agag, okay? So don't get any ideas. These are Old Testament remedies. It's our job to give our lives for God's enemies. That's what our Savior did. The Muslim approach in jihad is if the infidel is not going to repent, then we're going to kill him and get him into hell as soon as possible, so we'll have less infidels. The Christian approach is my goal is to die before the infidel to give him a little more time so maybe he can join me in heaven. To get him into heaven later, not to get him into hell soon. But we can appropriate the spiritual lessons from the, the physical battles as we do our, our kind of warfare. And we see that the man who taught Israel how to go to worship is the same man who taught Israel how to go to war. Now, in that first famous story, one of the most famous stories in the history of the world, there was a very big warrior who was blaspheming God and taunting the children of Israel, the armies of Israel. And the scripture says, 
In 1 Samuel 17, 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The necessary path to spiritual growth is the proper allocation of fear. There are healthy fears. There are mature fears and there are immature fears. A child may be afraid of the dark. That's an immature fear. But a child may not be afraid to play on the railroad track. That's an immature bravado. If we fear God, Jesus says, don't fear the one who can kill the body. And Jesus doesn't deny, yeah, there's somebody out there who may kill your body. I'm not saying that's never going to happen. Don't fear the one who can kill the body. Fear the one who can dispose of the, the, the body and the soul in hell. That's, that's who you need to fear. And if we fear him first and supremely, that will automatically allocate the disposition of all other fears. When I was pastor at First of Ann, um, we used to have these stacking trays for communion. A, a, an artisan in our church built these beautiful uh, communion trays with finials. I learned that word by studying those trays. Those are the little spokes that go up. Uh, finials on the top and holes on the bottom. And so what would happen, and there were, there were four holes and four spokes. And the thing you gotta remember about me is I'm blind in my right eye. Here's what that means. I don't have any depth perception. Um, you know, I, sometimes in the outfield, I, the ball would hit my glove, sometimes it hit my head. You know, I don't, I don't have any depth perception. And it's a real adventure in a parking lot with me, you know, um, cause I, ju I just can't judge this. When I, was a teenager, a teenager I, would, I would date girls, you know, and they smoked, and I liked their cigarette, and, you know, if they had, it was kind of a challenge for me, if they had on petroleum-based makeup, I mean, their face could go up in flames, you know, because I, I couldn't always get near the end of the cigarette. So here's, you know, 500 pair of eyes out there, and old one eye's up there trying to, trying to get that communion tray lined up because you could get two of them lined up just right and the thing would still be off you know and the men would come up with their trays and there'd be one tray there going like that because they let Ronnie put it on here's what I found out after deep study and prayer I found out that I could feel the hole at two o'clock and I could feel the hole at four o'clock and I can look at the hole at eight o'clock and if you had three holes lined up to three spokes, the fourth spoke was necessarily lined up perfectly. You get two right and still be off, but if you got three right, the fourth one, it was mechanically inevitable it was in the right place. So I didn't have to look at two o'clock. So I, so I only have one eye, but I have 10 fingers. So I used two fingers and one eye, and I just, boy, I really nailed it. I mean, I became an expert. I'm sure people sat up there and said, man, do you see what he stacks those trays? Well, here's the deal. Here's why I wasted all our time on that. Um, Augustine said, love God and do what you like. Now, that can be abused, obviously. But if we understand the, the sense in which Augustine said that, we see, we see the point. Love God, fear God, and do what you like. You get the allocation of your loves and your fears in the right place. Everything else is going to line up. You don't have to look at it that hard, as long as you're looking at the Lord and looking to the Lord. Now, um, in 1 Samuel 17... A giant killer could not found, be found in Israel. In 2 Samuel 23, you'll see the same series of verses, by the way, in 1 Chronicles 20. You see the same kind of list with the same kinds of reports. Uh, man, there are giant killers everywhere. I mean, you can't round a corner too fast in Israel. You might run into a giant killer. You've got to be careful where you step. You might step on the toe of a giant killer. Giant killers are everywhere. Giant killers have names that we never learned, names that we've forgotten. 
because there are too many of them. Because, I mean, there's nothing more common in Israel than a giant killer. What changed? What changed was in 1 Samuel 17, the person that they were following had never killed a giant. Nor was it his, nor was it his ambition to face a giant. The men who are listed in 2 Samuel 23 and 1 Chronicles 20, their leader was a giant killer. By definition, you can't get ahead of the person you're following. And so when they're following a, a, a giant killer, guess what they were learning to do? They were learning to kill giants. Probably, probably, the most successful general in the history of the world was Alexander. And definitely, they said the key to his victories was not so much his brilliance as a strategist, but his participation as a tactician, because he fought at the front of the battle line. He didn't use his rank to escape danger. If winning the, the point was important enough to risk his men's life, then he deemed it important enough to risk his own life. That was the secret of the expansion of his empire all the way to India by age 33. Okay. Um, I just want to say this. I hadn't said those things before on Tuesday morning. I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to tell you something that I've said a couple of times, and maybe you remember it. I hope you'll lock it in, and I hope you'll apply it. But here's what I want to say. There's a little devotional study by a very a justifiably obscure author on the book of Acts here. We have to ask ourselves the question, why do we have the book of Acts? Well, Acts is volume two of a two-volume work. The first volume is Luke. Think of the reasons. I'm about to land this thing. Don't worry. I'm not going to go much longer. Think of all the reasons not to write the gospel of Luke. Number one, it had been done before. Number two, it had been done twice. Number three, it had been done perfectly twice. Number four, it had been done perfectly twice by two authors who had an unapproachable advantage over Luke because Matthew and Mark knew Jesus personally, which Luke did not. Now, if you ask most Christians who wrote the book, or who wrote the most of the, of the New Testament, they'll tell you Paul. And that would be wrong. And they say Paul because Paul wrote most of the books. But if you don't count Hebrews, which I don't, some wonderful Bible teachers do, but I don't. If you don't count Hebrews, Luke, in those two volumes, Luke Acts, wrote more words than Paul wrote in his 13 epistles. So I just gave you four reasons that he could have used as excuses. Let me tell you something. It was a big deal to write something as long as Luke and Acts in the first century. A really big deal. He was a doctor who became a missionary, who became a writer historian. And he was not duplicating an effort, he was triplicating an effort that had already been done perfectly by those with insuperable advantages over him. Why did he do it? To help one person. And see, Henry threw at that challenge about Uganda, and you're thinking, man, I'm probably not going to do that. And he said, okay, well, you know what? Uganda's far away. Maybe you're too old. Maybe you're too, 
Maybe you're not going to buy a ticket. Maybe your doctor won't let you go. But you know what? Shelby Farms, that's just right over here. What's your excuse there? Well, um, maybe we're never going to kill a giant. Luke found one person who knew more than he. And he served him by learning from him. That person was named Paul. Luke found one person who knew less than he. And he served him by teaching him. That person was named Theophilus. And because Luke, and we know almost nothing about Theophilus, we don't even know whether he was saved or not. Some Christians say he, would, he was a brand new Christian and probably uh, Luke Acts was a, a kind of catechism that Luke drafted just for him. I don't, maybe that's true. I don't know whether it's true or not. My, my personal opinion is that Theophilus was almost there, but not quite. And that, that Luke wrote the gospel and the only inspired church history in history to help one person just get there. He was almost there, but he wasn't quite there. So Luke made this stupendous effort to get him there. Just one person. Christian, you don't have any idea how much good can come from your just trying to disciple, or you don't have to call it discipleship, just, just, trying, to, just trying to encourage one person in the faith. You, can you encourage one person in the faith? Maybe they're not quite a Christian yet, so you encourage them to believe in Jesus and to come to Jesus. Or maybe they're already a Christian and you're encouraging them to grow as a Christian. You know, I'll tell you what, you can, you can encourage people to grow as a Christian who are far ahead of you in the Christian life. I, I learned so much. I learned something yesterday from a guy I'm supposed to be discipling. He was born 30 years after I was ordained. Just one person. And if Luke had said, you know, it's been done twice, it's been done perfectly, my time could be more uh, productively and effectively spent doing something else instead of duplicating what Matthew and Mark has already done. If he had said that, you would not know the meaning of the term Good Samaritan. You would not know the meaning of the term prodigal son. You would not know that Mary was inclined to sit and listen and Martha was inclined to stand and serve. You would not know the four hymns of Christmas. Do you know that you know four hymns from Christmas? Do you know that the ancient teachers gave them Latin names? The Benedictus of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist the Magnificat of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the glory in its Chelsea's Deo of the angels, and the Nuc Dimittis, which means now depart, now I'll depart, of Simeon. Remember Simeon and Anna when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple and Simeon had this prophecy and this promise that he would not die until he saw the deliverer of Israel and he held Jesus and he said, Nuc de Minas, now, now I can go. And he, he starts to sing. He said, the Lord, the Lord kept his promise. We know those things because a doctor who began to be a travel companion of Paul was trying to help one person named Theophilus. You can't measure the benefit which may accrue to a commitment to encourage one person in the faith. Let me tell you something. You don't need to take giant leaps. Growth is, is the um, culmination of small, consistent steps. So, Take them.